thanks so much for having me here. Um, I want to uh, get, start out with a, a disclaimer that I'm finding it harder and harder to give talks about AI and machine learning these days because the research is now like getting to a frontier, but at the same time what's interesting to a general audience is often just defining the problems. So today I'm going to mostly define and motivate the problems and then I will rush through some slides at the end that show you that I'm actually doing publishable research with math about it. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the bigger goal is uh, to try to use AI and ML to actually help people. Um, and so I'm going to talk today about try the work that I'm doing with a, with a group of collaborators at Stanford to try to really create a platform for social scientists to be able to create innovations that are helpful for humans. And so just as motivation, you know, many aspects of the digital revolution are, have economic characteristics that are actually really amenable to social applications. So in particular, if you think about any place where we're trying to interact with people to get them to teach them, to get them to be literate, to convince them to save or to diet, um, to, to, to help them do things that they should do, um, it's, gotten, it's never been easier to reach them, to talk to them, to interact with them, and, and to do that in a low-cost way. And whether that's you know, providing agricultural advice in Africa, or we're, we're doing contraceptive advice in Africa, to trying to help literacy problems. And so, you know, we, we not only we can reach consumers through their phones, but we can often also measure their, their responses. We may not be able to fully measure the thing we care about, like whether literacy actually helps you you know, have better life quality, but we might be able to measure how well you learn to read if you're using my app to help you learn to read. Um, we can, and, and we're, we, we've got lots of things actually that it's not so hard to move people a little bit on, if, if, whether it's getting out to vote or, um, you know, save for retirement. And so one of the nice things about this whole family of in innovation around AI is that it tends to have sort of, you know, high fixed costs and low marginal costs of delivery. So there's actually some hope that, that we in universities or in collaboration with tech firms, if we can sort of provide some of the basic R&D, that we actually could scale these innovations to large numbers of people. With the caveat that there's sort of this customer acquisition cost, that it's not actually completely easy to get in front of a consumer. But just an example, I'm, I'm starting a project with Facebook and you know, hopefully you know, we could use their platform to reach people and you know, even if we only reach a small fraction of them, that's still a lot of people. Um, and so really, um, the, 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 there's two parts of the, of the kind of scientific advances that I think are really exciting. The first is sort of the, the AI and, and itself, and second is the business processes around making it better. So the incremental innovation. This is something I pushed last year in a lot of the comments, but if you actually think about what's magical about Google and Amazon, it's not that there's some brilliant person who came up with an idea for how to lay out the screen. It's that they just they threw something up and then over the course of years and tens of thousands of small experiments got to something that really works well. And so that's actually very encouraging because I, you know, I talk to people from education or labor and some of them are very discouraged. They say, oh, well, we have no idea what works. You think, you know, that's okay. Like if we, if we, are, if we can explore, maybe we can learn. And so basically the, the broader agenda that I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to commit myself to and spend a lot of my time on is to, to three parts, use theoretical and empirical social science to identify targets of opportunity, whether that's you know, literacy or you know, um, poor children or whatever, um, and also places where there are these candidates for good interventions. Then prototype, test, and develop these solutions at universities or in collaboration with social startups, um, with ed tech startups, or with companies like Facebook and PayPal or some of the collaborations that I have. Um, and then finally use economic incentives and philanthropy to scale those sort of once you've been able to develop something. And so we're doing that. We're starting an AI initiative at Stanford that I'm um, going to be having a leadership role at. And then within that, the part that really focuses on this will, is an initiative um, that on, for, called Shared Prosperity and Innovation. So to, to focus in a little more on the, this category of, pro of, of technologies and problems, we're thinking about teaching and nudging humans. The problem is it's still not all that clear what works. Um, we, our training programs, like if somebody's unemployed, you know, we send them to a resume writing workshop. It's very one size fits all. A lot of these programs are, are it's like not surprising they have modest effects because they're really actually like not very good. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard to make them better. Um, 
and so we have all these unreached populations where we also think that it, it could really matter to customize it. So one of the big promises of machine learning and AI is that we can have personalization. Now, that's not something that we've typically done a lot of work on in the past of being economics. Our data sets weren't big enough, and we didn't have a lot of tools to do that. So we worried about pre-analysis plans and p-value hacking and so on. And that's been one of the focus of my machine learning research is to overcome those things and discover personalized effects while still having um, good standard errors and so on. And so actually, we've, we've started a whole slew of projects to now apply this in practice. One of the ones that's bearing early fruit is with Justine Hastings Ripple Lab, where they're looking at Rhode Island reemployment services and showing that basically they're really good for some people. They're actually discouraging for certain groups of white men um, that, that there's actually a negative effect. You stay on unemployment longer after you go to these workshops. I guess you don't like what they tell you about what your prospects are. And you, know, you don't want to wash old humans and change diapers or whatever it is. And so you, you just say, I'm just going to plug my benefits and go home. Um, and so we, we estimate the benefit of a personalized or targeted policy and show that it, it's substantially better. And then in progress, like David Brockman at Stanford is using techniques like this for voter mobilization this, in this election period. We've done historical analysis of voter mobilization in Gerber and Green. I use that for teaching. Um, we've revisited the GAIN experiment in California for target, targeted um, application of it. We're working on a project with the World Bank. I'm working with Julian Jameson and Bert Osler um, for, for uh, using these types of methods I'll talk about to try to learn how to give good contraceptive advice to young women in Africa. Um, we're working on a charitable giving project, potentially with PayPal. Um, Ideas42 is another big organization that Sindel Melanathan was starting, and with Jan Spies and some others, we're trying to put these ideas into practice with a lot of their socially focused um, experiments. And so the, the, the goal here now is to, not, is to build a set of tools that really makes this work at scale. So before we think that like, we can just take something off the shelf from Google or Microsoft or Amazon, it's actually the case that even those firms are really actually not at the research frontier. So like my husband Hito Inman's just changed the way that Amazon does its A-B testing and like all the experimentation at Amazon is going to be different because of that economist, one of my former students at Facebook is changing the way they're evaluating experiments at Facebook. A lot of that has to do with incorporating the fact that they were evaluating tests as if each experiment was in isolation, but in fact they're running 10,000 of them a year, so maybe you should think about it a little differently. Um, so there's actually a ton of questions on the research frontier, even for the tech firms, and actually only the most advanced groups and the most advanced tech firms are really using the state of the art or what we think of as the state of the art. So there's a few examples, like there's a group from Microsoft Research um, that, is, that has done this, there's some, there's some Facebook and so on, but it's, it's really actually not as sophisticated as you think. So part of the agenda is to push out that frontier and make it more off the shelf so that then we can take those techniques into the, the social context. And so the, the big project, which I'm going to tell you just a bit about today, that I'm working on with uh, my lab at Stanford, is basically a platform for what we call contextual bandits. And it's intended to be more targeted towards these social science applications. And so the idea is that if you're going to go out and do a field experiment, or maybe your field experiment is sort of digitally delivered, you may not know, first of all, what information is actually relevant for personalizing my experiment? Like, what, what data do I need to gather about people in order to know how to assign the policy? So you might think of 100 different things that could matter, but you don't know which, hundred they, which of the 100 are important. Um, and you can't ask everything. It's expensive to gather data about people in many contexts. And I don't know the personalized policy. Like, I don't know the mapping from people's characteristics to the treatment I should give them. And so even if I'm, my ultimate goal is to go out and do this with real people, which like, you know, maybe I'll do this on, on PayPal customers or I'll do this on Facebook customers, in my research phase, I need a way to prototype this and sort of narrow things down. And so our platform basically allows you to run Mechanical Turk experiments or Google Surveys experiments and then use what's called uh, contextual bandits to try to learn a personalized policy that you could then sort of deploy at larger scale. Um, and so that's, that's this big software project we're working, working on. Um, and along the way, we're, we're writing papers about to fill in the gaps in the literature. So um, when I think about what are the goals of bandits, well, we start with, with to think about randomized experiments. So of course, randomized experiments revolutionize policy analysis in fields like development by providing credible, credible evidence about what works. So what's wrong with randomized experiments? 
Well, the idea, the thing with those is that you have to like spend a lot of time figuring out what you're going to test, and then you spend like a year testing it, and then you come back, and most of the time it doesn't work. So it's not a very rapid innovation cycle. And actually, talking to firms in ed tech, they're like, yeah, we kind of are moving away from some of these randomized evaluations because it takes so much time and it's not really actionable. So what they would rather do is sort of be more nimble and be able to learn faster. So of course, as I mentioned, in tech firms, basically what they do is lots and lots and lots of small experiments to make projects better, but it's still most commonly done as a sequence of individual randomized tests rather than a fully dynamic experimentation. And so what bandits do is basically allow you to start out with many, many arms, and then as you learn which arm is working well, you allocate more people to the arms that are working well, and you discard the ones that are working badly. And again, you know, Facebook is using this in production for some things. There's a, there's a platform that, that some Microsoft researcher, researchers used for Microsoft, for MSN. Um, Google has a platform for advertisers to optimize with this, but it's still actually not as common as you would think to be used in practice. Um, so bringing this into social science, actually unlike most of our whining about machine learning, oh, it's all about prediction, it's not about causal inference, this is actually one where we just collectively missed the boat. Um, they, the, this literature frames it as a causal problem. They frame it correctly kind of from the start. They are solving a causal inference problem and they are using economic trade-offs. They're actually smarter than our experimenters who are just thinking it from a purely statistical perspective. They're instead actually thinking about there being a loss function for the people in the experiment and we're going to balance exploration and exploitation, which is the way a sensible economist would set this up. Now, they did actually um, skip a few things, like they didn't read econometrics, so they, they actually have left some room for us to improve it, but they actually figured out a fair number of things as well. Good, they're, they're good enough. We've had almost no attention to this in economics, which is just kind of a travesty. So what do we need to bring this into economics? Well, in some sense, we, we can just use it off the shelf, but there's a few things I think are missing. First of all, employ, incorporating real world considerations and objectives. So if I'm gonna run an MTurk experiment, I actually have like a couple thousand dollars before my dean would start complaining at me for a specific experiment. You know, so I've got a budget constraint and the people answering questions, their time costs money and so on. So I wanna think about what's the most I can learn within a fixed budget. I might also have a goal not just to what the machine learning people focus on is the regret in the experiment. So they just want to average up the utility of all the people in the experiment. But usually my experiment is actually just a stepping stone to something else. So I want to might put more weight on the future and also think about testing hypotheses at the end. Like my whole project is going to get canceled and I won't get published if I can't test the hypothesis at the end. So maybe I should put some weight on my statistical power to test an interesting hypothesis which would then justify going to the next stage. So these are all things that are not really part of the machine learning literature here. And then there's just the fact that the whole machine learning literature here is a bit of a mismatch of heuristics. And as a social scientist, you would have no idea which one to choose. So just to see what the problem looks like set up, and now this is when I'm going to go really fast through a bunch of math, but I'll try to still be coherent. Um, the, just to get an idea of what this is really about, we can think of there being M arms. These are all different treatment arms. So it could be different emails that you would send to people, or it could be um, you know, different ways to convince people to save for charity. We, get, we have a potential outcome, so each person has a potential outcome with each of the possible arms. And that can depend on covariance. So the thing that makes this problem actually especially hard, and, and, and that's where the econometrics really starts to matter, is that if I want to do it in a personalized way, then actually I'm trying to learn a function, not just learn which arm is better on average, but I'm trying to learn a mapping from people's characteristics to the arm that's best. And that, that's a hard thing. I'm trying to learn a fully non-parametric function of multiple covariates and multiple arms. And so you think you need a lot of data to do that, so it's actually really useful to have bandits that are going to use your data efficiently and learn about what matters because you just don't have enough data to learn about everything. So the expected outcome, mu of wx, would be the conditional expectation of your potential outcome with arm w if your covariates are x. The optimal rule would be for people with covariates x, the thing that maximizes that expected value. So we're not trying to personalize based on the unobservables, just personalize based on the observables. And then the regret is basically just the gap between the expected potential outcomes if I assign you to the, the treatment, which is the optimal policy, minus what I actually treat you with in the experiment. 
And again, this is like, you know, we're, we're used to having those W's were given to us by God, and then we're going to analyze that experiment and figure out an optimal policy. Well, here, we're actually going to create the W's. And I should mention that that makes it actually really hard to compare different algorithms, because if you run a band at once, I only see the potential outcomes for the, for the people that I assigned to. So if I want to say counterfactually what would happen if I used a different statistical method, I can't use the data to do that because I, if I used a different method, I would have assigned different arms to different people. And so, I, so my existing data can only be used once. So this is one reason I'm building my platform because if I want to test different methods, I actually have to run lots of different experiments. I'll, I'll show you a little trick we use to use observational data to do this, but that's actually, most of this literature is simulation based for that reason. And, that's, and so that's one reason there's actually really very few empirical applications. So I still feel like, you know, the first few empirical applications will get a lot of play. So what we want to do is then find a mapping, and now it's actually a series of policies that there, for each observation, there's a new policy because the policy is going to take all of the historical data together with the covariates of this person and then come up with a probability of assignment for each arm. So this is actually a very complicated function space, so it makes it pretty hard to analyze theoretically. Amazingly enough, there are a bunch of theorems about this in one of my papers. We have a nice theorem about this, but the theorems are actually a little bit unsatisfying, partly because the, the complexity is so hard. So they, they all kind of say, gosh, if you run this long enough, the regret goes down, or the regret can be bounded, but they, they don't actually tell you exactly what to do because it's, it's so hard to, to analyze it in a really fine level of detail how they work. And so the big benefit of these things is they focus the scarce observations on arms that are best candidates for an optimal policy. So um, just to get a sense of how the experimentation works, there's a couple of heuristics. Um, this is called upper confidence bounds. And basically, given my historical data, if there's arms A, B, and C, I can say I've got a, a, a mean and a standard deviation for each arm. And this is just in the case with no covariates. And so what, what upper confidence bounds says is for the next person who comes along, if these were my means and standard deviations, with probability one, I would assign the next person to arm A because the top of the confidence interval looks the best for arm A. And believe it or not, that heuristic works. And it actually has the best theoretical guarantees, although it actually doesn't work as well in practice as other things, which is just a sign that the theory is defective um, or, or just incomplete, um, doesn't provide enough useful guidance. The one that I prefer and that we show works a lot better in practice in our simulations is called Thompson sampling. It's more of a Bayesian perspective. For each arm, you have a, a posterior belief about what's best, and you actually assign the arms according to the probability that arm is best. So at this moment, if I think that arm A is best with probability 0.7 and arm B with 0.3, I use those probabilities to assign. Again, seems crazy. Why would this heuristic work? But there's actually a bunch of, of stuff that shows that that is a good heuristic. Um, there's epsilon greedy, which just says you occasionally you experiment. The, another sad thing is that there's actually a bunch of theory that says that this works very well, which it shouldn't, which just again goes to show you that the theory is a little bit defective. Um, okay, so the bandits use data more efficiently than A-B tests. So this is off of a Google website that is just showing some examples of this. So if you had an A-B test you were trying to run with two arms, you can calculate, if, if all you wanted to do was figure out which arm was best, they're looking at how many days would you save by using a bandit relative to A-B testing. And the idea was that in this example, there was uh, 100 people exposed per day, and, but you have to keep running until you figure things out in the bandit. And in the A-B test, you have to do a fully powered A-B test in order to figure out which one's better, but you would stop a lot sooner with the bandit. But with two arms, you don't get that many benefits, but with six arms or 10 arms or 20 arms, you get huge benefits. Um, it's sort of exponential. So this is just an example of, um, it takes uh, two years to do six arms and usually most of the time like less than like 100 days for, for one arm. Okay, so what do you do with covariates? Well, that's a much harder problem. I have this lovely paper that tells you some interesting things. Let me show you, tell you just a few of the ways that econometrics turned out to, to matter here. So if you're actually thinking about a case with lots of covariates, if I see someone come along, I'm never gonna be see somebody else just like them. So I should actually think of that, that person as an input to an estimation problem rather than thinking of that person as just another, there's going to be someone else just like them that I'm exploring for. 
And so it turns out that that changes the way you would want to do bandits, and this is not something the machine learning people have thought about because they don't think about estimation problems. So just as an example, we show that lasso-based models work better than ridge-based models because lasso-based models are simpler. And that creates, sim if I use a simple model to assign you today, then I'm going to have an easier time estimating what I should do tomorrow. And so there's a push towards simplicity. We also um, show that you do better with inverse propensity weighting uh, to try to deal with biases, or, um, and they, that's not something that had been a focus. So big picture, though, is that, yep, I'm out of time. Um, there are, I think that this, as a, what I really want to sell is that actually this technique can be incredibly useful for social scientists, and we should start using them. There's a bunch of details to be worked out about how you do it, which makes some interesting econometric theory papers. But ultimately, you know, you should hope that we kind of sort those things out. But in practice, it's actually, I think, going to be a very interesting tool. And we're getting a lot of inbound interest from all, all sorts of different public policy organizations and, and firms that are interested in trying to apply this in practice. So I hope the economists get on the bad bandwagon and start, uh, and start getting involved in this area. Uh, what are the implications for the economy? And, and this paper has, uh, in some sense, a, a very different focus, which is like, for starters, how can economists help improve the AI, AI methods themselves? And I think, relatedly, how do we think about using AI methods as a tool for scientific discovery? So I think it's very uh, nicely complementary to the other papers on the, uh, on the panel. Um, and so the specific problem that she's uh, examining, contextual bandit, is an elaboration of uh, a classic problem, uh, multi-armed bandit, which stemmed actually from World War II. Here's a quote from the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, where the suggestion was the problem was so hard they should take it and uh, drop flyers over Germany to waste the time of all the German scientists. And as someone who was born in Germany, I've always wondered to myself, like, what would have happened? Imagine the, the German scientific talent that would have been deployed to this problem. We would have people like this, people like this, even people like this. Um, who, who knows, maybe, the, maybe Susan's paper would have been rendered obsolete decades ago had they actually done that. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, uh, Susan talked a little bit about, uh, about why this is a hard problem. And so sort of one high level thing to say about her paper is I think you know there are lots of details that she didn't go to uh, go into in the short presentation, but I think one sort of high level takeaway from this is it's a really nice illustration of the value of sort of cross fertilizing ideas from econometrics into machine learning. And I think Susan and Huido and their Stanford team I think have been really uh, been real leaders in illustrating the power of that approach. And I think there's lots of other uh, other work uh, to be done there. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some of the different applications then that you might uh, think of for these methods and some of the other issues that arise. So um, here's an example of one, uh, one kind of problem uh, out in the real world, which is we have uh, public institutions like the City University of New York, and we have a bunch of uh, college students, including first generation college goers like me, who ask themselves questions like, what the hell should I major in? And some of us chose, chose our major um, based on uh, which courses and majors would let us sleep as late as possible on Mondays. I can't remember if this was from my freshman or uh, sophomore year, actually. Um, Susan mentioned uh, one of the constraints in applying machine learning methods to social science problems historically has been limited data. But as government agencies are becoming increasingly good at digitizing everything, that's becoming less of a constraint. If you think about the CUNY application, um, you know, they have 274,000 students per year, nearly 1,800 different academic programs. Something like 80% of the CUNY students went to the New York City Department of Education. So we have all of their longitudinal information about what courses they took and how they did in those courses. And so you can bring a very long data set, a very wide data set, to bear on this prediction problem. So I think one of the sort of the interesting things to start to think about then um, is what happens when you start to take these machine learning tools from the online digital environment to the real world, or I guess what software engineers have come to call meat space. Um, and you know, if you think about uh, treatment arm assignment in an online digital application, it's like Amazon decides to show you ad A versus ad B. 
using the observable Xs of customers, because what else could Amazon possibly do? Compare that to the situation of CUNY, right, where you have historical data on student course selections and various subsequent outcomes, all of it self-selected, right? And this creates a large list, a long list of problems that become very familiar to economists, right? And you know, I think this is not exactly Susan's paper, but I'm sure this is going to be on the agenda, right? It's critically important. There are some papers on this in computer science, but I find them very unhelpful. Um, and I think I've been trying to reflect a little bit on why the computer science literature is not so helpful on this. And at least most of the computer science papers I read have the flavor of, here's a method, then let me find a data set somewhere off the web that just lets me illustrate my method, rather than being really deeply immersed in solving the problems themselves. And so I think the immersion in the problems, I think, is one, um, uh, one sort of source of comparative advantage for economists in working on these methods, even in terms of developing the, uh, you know, the methods themselves, not just applications. I think another example of uh, something that comes up that's new when you move from the online environment to the real world is not, imagine like Amazon's problem or Facebook's problem when you think about what the outcome is in a contextual bandit problem. It is something very straightforward like does the person click through the ad, right? Now imagine you're going to build a recommender system for CUNY. What the hell is even the outcome, right? I think if you introspect on this for five or 10 minutes, you can think of probably five very reasonable outcome measures that you could define for this pr prediction problem. I think there's a very important sort of insight here is like imagine that you're actually going to do this for real and build a recommender system and feed it back to CUNY students. You get the choice of outcome wrong, you can build a recommender system that actually ruins people's lives, right? And I think in a paper we, uh, we had come out earlier this year, we call this problem where you're predicting one thing, but a broader set of outcomes goes into the person's utility function as omitted payoff bias. And I think this is something, obviously, that economists are particularly well positioned to think about and worry about. Um, let me use the, the last sort of four minutes that I have to just talk uh, to highlight the richness of machine learning for the types of applications that people in this room tend to think about. And let me just, to highlight the richness, let me actually stay very narrow just within the higher education space, right? So here's a different sort of problem that CUNY worries about, which is who the hell are the students who show up at CUNY in the first place? Right? And so, for, for instance, uh, Carolyn Hoxby and Sarah Turner have done a bunch of interesting work pointing out a very, what seems to me like a very important social problem of high achieving, low opportunity students. Poor kids who are doing really well in high school under applied to their colleges. So now you're, imagine that you're an admissions officer at Baruch, which is one of the most selective CUNY campuses, and you're trying to find these kids. You have access to the entire CUNY applicant pool. Can you go through? and find the kids who are not applying to Baruch, but who would do really well at Baruch. So you know, that is a simpler problem than what Susan's trying to address in the contextual bandit uh, setting, but still super important, right? This is like garden variety machine learning that is mostly about just getting the rank ordering by predicted success at Baruch, right? But even there, we start to see some really interesting methodological questions where econometric intuition is really important. For instance, especially given what's, uh, what's going on in the news right now, for instance, should this algorithm that Baruch is building to find the high achieving low opportunity kids have access to race and ethnicity for the, for the applicants? Okay, and so there's a huge literature in computer science devoted to uh, starting from the presumption that the answer is unambiguously no. And I think the answer is not actually as straightforward as, uh, as that. So let me show you an empirical uh, example of this. So you can imagine predicting, suppose what one thing a college wants to do is admit kids who are not going to flunk out at the school. So the, you want to minimize the share of kids who will have low GP, GPAs if they come. You can imagine using three different prediction algorithms for GPA, race-blind algorithm, uh, another thing that lots of computer scientists argue we should be doing is orthogonalizing the predictors to race before you feed them into the algorithm. And then a race-aware algorithm, the sort of thing that the, sort of the fat ML community says you should never, ever do if you care about fairness. And so then you can imagine building a prediction tool with these three different algorithms. 
And then you can imagine saying, what are the admissions outcomes that would result under different diversity goals? So I've got a different threshold for white and African American applicants. I can set those to whatever levels I want to get whatever diversity composition of the incoming class that I want. And here's what you see when you do that in practice. So this is the share of admits that are African American. This is the share that have mostly Bs. You want this to be as low as possible. You want, for efficiency reasons, you want this to be as large as possible for equity reasons. And you can see this blue line here is the frontier that you get from the race-aware algorithm. Right? So this is, I think, another example of how sort of this reflexive heuristic orientation within computer science about, in this case, what's fair leads to a bunch of outcomes that wind up making things much worse, actually. Um, OK, uh, let me skip that in the interest of time. This is, I think, just scratching the surface of the richness of the sort of problems, even just within this incredibly narrow situation of higher education. So now, imagine one more step. Imagine now that you're an institution that doesn't just care about how kids will do at your institution. You want to find kids where having them come to your school adds lots of value. You're the University of Chicago admissions office saying you want to save kids from poor undergraduate instruction at places like Harvard. Um, all of a sudden, this is a treatment heterogeneity problem, right? And this is, again, this is not something that computer scientists have really been working on. And in contrast, Susan and Guido have this paper that I think is going to, you know, in years, if not months, is going to become standard for program evaluation uh, throughout economics. And so I think, you know, very, very exciting line of research, very different from what we saw in the morning. Um, I think this is just another uh, exciting example of that agenda, but lots and lots of other uh, super interesting things for people to do here. Thanks very much.